Neural networks classically use 32-bit floating point values to store the weights, activations, and gradients during forward and backward propagation. Reduced precision describes this idea of using 8 or 16-bit values instead of the 32-bit floating point values. There's been a lot of exciting news about using reduced precision through things like quantization to 8 and 16 bits in order to accelerate inference with already trained models showing that this doesn't result in less accuracy. Reduced precision and mixed precision where you switch between 16 and 32 bit precision for different layers is also very useful for training models. With new additions to the Keras API with TensorFlow 2.1, getting started with mixed precision is as easy as adding these two lines of code. Mixed precision describes using 16-bit floating points to store weights, activations, and gradients in some layers, and then using regular 32-bit floating points in other layers where necessary, like normalization layers or the softmax before the output. In addition to speed gains, because tensor cores are optimized to process these 16-bit floating points faster than 32 bits, this will help you avoid out-of-memory errors because the 16-bit floating points reduce the memory footprint of your model during forward and backward propagation. So this will result in you being able to potentially increase your model and batch sizes. This chart shows results from NVIDIA on using mixed precision for different tasks like image classification, seeing about a three times speed up, object detection, and then things like neural machine translation. This article also details how mixed precision reduces the training time of this Gaugan model that converts these rough sketches into photorealistic images from 21 days to 13 days, which can definitely make an enormous difference with respect to developing and iterating on these kinds of models. These kinds of speedups can largely be attributed to the speedups by having these tensor cores that can do things like the matrix multiplication much faster with these 16-bit floating points compared to 32-bit. It also may be sped up because you can have a larger batch size, which may help with uh, your convergence properties, although you know there's definitely some things to consider with increasing your batch size, and you also can potentially have bigger models. This video will walk through the updated TensorFlow documentation on their Mixed Precision Training API, as well as this research paper on Mixed Precision Training. We'll look at some things to be aware of with this, like which layers such as batch norm and output softmaxes to keep in FP32, loss scaling to avoid underflow with small gradients, and keeping a master FP32 copy of the weights. We'll also look at some interesting results from this, such as the image classification, object detection, and different, you know, even GAN results reported in this paper on using mixed precision training. The mixed precision documentation first shows how you can quickly get started with some mixed precision policy that is automatically implemented and automatically applies things like dynamic loss scaling and allocating which layers are going to be 16-bit and 32-bit. So they start off with this sort of encouragement that using this API can improve performance by more than three times on modern GPUs and 60% on the TPUs, sort of attributing that these TPUs already kind of do some of this optimization under the hood. So they start off the documentation by showing how to import this kind of a policy, the from tensorflow.keras.mixprecision import experimental as mixed precision. So then they show you how you can initialize it. You do policy equals mixed precision dot policy, and they're going to start off with this mixed float 16 policy. So then you can inspect the, uh, the, the data type of the policy as well as the variables. So they're going to do this thing where they have a master copy of the variables that are 32-bit floating point numbers, which is something that we'll look at more with the research paper. So then they show you how you can build a model. So really the same syntax as always, just with uh, you know showing you how you can just have that uh, line of code earlier and then just compile the model and then build it and it'll automatically implement this for you. After they show you how that you can build the model as usual, they begin the discussion on which layers you want to keep in 16 and 32 bit and then which ones you want to switch to 16 bit. So they show that the output softmax layer, you want to put that into a 32 bit floating point for numerical stability issues. So they show you how to do that just by adding this argument D type equals float 32 when you're defining this softmax activation layer. So then they finish uh, building the model, load in the MNIST data set as an example for if you want to try this out by using the model.fit and test it yourself. So they describe how you can just switch the policy from mixed float 16 to float 32 if you want to sort of A-B test the mixed precision versus the original training. So then they begin the discussion of loss scaling. So the high-level idea of loss scaling is that now that we have uh, less precision, we can only go these, this range from you know, 65,000 to about 6 times 10 to the minus 8. So the idea here is that you have overflow and underflow. So particularly we're interested in underflow because sometimes you have these gradients that are really, really small with respect to the loss and different weights. So we want to have this loss scaling where we're multiplying the gradient by a large number like a thousand to avoid having underflow with the gradient. The documentation describes the idea of loss scaling, which is to multiply the loss by a large number such as to avoid underflow with the 16-bit floating point precision. So then they describe how by default you'll have this dynamic loss scale, which is dynamically going to uh, increase the loss scale you can check it by inspecting it by having the loss scale equals policy.loss scale and seeing how it has the current loss scale, 
the number of steps, I think, until it, uh, you know, increases it, and then sort of how much it increases it by, which I think is the multiplier parameter of this sort of uh, function call. So then they describe how you can also use a fixed policy, a fixed uh, loss scale, if you just pass it into the parameters of defining the mixed precision policy like this. The documentation then describes how this mixed precision policy fits in with having a custom training loop if you want to have more control over your training loop than model.fit. Then it describes some recommendations for doing this. Things like increasing your batch size now that you have the float 16 tensors that use half the memory, and then some other things with respect to the tensor cores, like how it's important to have multiples of eight with respect to things like how many filters you have in your convolutional layers, your dense layers, and then the uh, batch size multiple. So you want it to be say 32, 64, 128, 256, so stuff like this. So then they describe some other things like the XLA compiler, the cloud TPU performance, and they describe the summary of the article just need to add these two lines just to get started with this. And then other things like uh, the softmax recommendation and then the multiples of eight with respect to the tensor dimensions. This paper, Mixed Precision Training, provides a great overview of mixed precision training, gives some techniques to help stabilize it, things like the loss scaling that we already discussed, and things like having a master copy of the weights. And they also give recommendations for which layers you want to keep in 32-bit floating point. And then they're going to show a suite of applications like image classification, object detection, and then even DC GANs to show which kind of models you need to have this sort of a loss scaling in order to stabilize the training. And overall, just showing how the accuracy between using you know, single precision 32-bit floating points is the same as using mixed precision, although the mixed precisions train much faster. This diagram is a great overview of what is happening with mixed precision training. So you see how you have the master weights in 32-bit floating point, then you cast them into 16-bit floats in order to do the forward pass where you have the weights in 16 bits, the activations in 16 bits, and then you, know, you have the activation gradients with respect to doing the backward propagation. So then when you're doing the weight update, you take the weight gradients in 30 and 16 bit floating points and you cast them into 32 bit floating points to update the master weight uh, copy. This first plot shows the importance of keeping a master copy of 32 bit floating point values for the weights when you're training an automatic speech recognition model. So this green plot is showing that when you don't have this master copy and you're updating the 16 bit weights, that you have sort of the accuracy actually gets worse than doing the regular single precision training. But when you add in this master copy of the weights, you have a similar performance with single precision and mixed precision training. So this histogram also shows this idea of loss scaling. So you see these gradients are gonna be set to zero due to underflow because of the limitations of the 16-bit floating point values. So the idea here is that you wanna multiply these by a certain value to shift them over this way and avoid this underflow region. And this is further shown in this plot with respect to training these uh, object detection, multi-box, single shot detector networks. So you see that in this case, you have a ton of weights or activations or gradients that are being set to zero due to underflow. So the idea here is that you wanna shift this whole histogram over to this right side of the plot in order to have the gradients account to the update. In this paper, the authors experiment with a lot of different applications with mixed precision training. So they start off with image recognition models, showing that the mixed precision performs the same as the baseline single precision on these different networks like AlexNet, VGG, Inception, and the different versions of Inception, and then a ResNet 50 on ImageNet classification. But then they show with object detection how you need this loss scaling in order to make you know, mixed precision work. So they show that without loss scaling on the multi-box uh, single shot detector, the, you know, the thing diverges and it doesn't even converge to a single uh, loss score. So then they show the results on speaker recognition, uh, machine translation, language modeling, and then interestingly they show this DC GAN. So they show sort of a qualitative result. The left is when you have the single precision and the right is the mixed precision. So you know, they're pretty similar just to show that you, know, you get basically the same results even though you're using mixed precision and training them faster, enabling larger batch size, and also allowing you to train larger models and avoid these out of memory errors. One of the reasons I'm really excited in mixed precision training and exploring this further is with respect to a lot of these models that find better results by simply scaling up the model size and having a larger batch size. So things like the big GAN where they have two to four times as many parameters and then eight times the batch size to improve this GAN training. And I've noticed from my own experience that when I increase the batch size, for things like training self-attention GANs and DC GANs that I get a better result. But there's another paper here that shows that sometimes when you have too large of a batch, comparing the testing accuracy on a small batch and a large batch, that the small batches outperform the large batch. And there's a lot of probably other things to consider with this with respect to batch normalization and these kinds of things. So it's definitely an interesting paper to check out uh, titled On Large Batch Training for Deep Learning Generalization Gap. So sort of describing sort of the pitfalls of using a large batch and a lot of other things that you have to be aware of with respect to scaling up your batch size, because that might be the most tempting thing to do once you have this automatic mixed precision training that helps you to you know, avoid out of memory error 
and train with a larger batch size. Thanks for watching this overview of mixed precision training, allowing you to take advantage of these tensor cores that are optimized for these 16-bit floating point matrix multiplications to have faster training. This also reduces the memory footprint, allowing for larger model sizes and larger batches. And I also think it's easier than ever to get started with mixed precision with the help of this new Keras API and the new documentation to sort of going through how to use it, things like you know setting each of the data types for different layers, and then also having this loss scaling parameter. So if you do try this, I'd be really interested to see what results you get. And thanks for watching. Please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.